So uh, moving on. So 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 people mentioned the Austria event. So that's going to be our next uh, our next talk. Uh, Bob Deason will will give us an overview of the Austria event from its origins to where it is now. So Bob Deason is the executive director of the Metals uh, Industry Research and Development Center uh, at the Philippine Department of Science and Technology. Bob. Oh, good morning, everyone. Can okay, you hear me, Dr. Vince? Yep, I can hear you well. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vince, for inviting me to participate in this uh, year's PASI conference. It's an honor to be talking in front of distinguished scientists, engineers, and medical professionals. I'm here to tell the story of how we developed the Austria Vent 2, the one you see on the right, from the original Austria Vent infant ventilator that is on the left. So we we, uh, Dr. Bondok and I are using the same picture. Anyway, way back in 2012, Dr. Enrique Austria, a professor of pediatrics at Wayne State University and a neonatologist at Hustle Women's Hospital and Children's Hospital of Michigan, formed a team of mechanical and electrical engineers from the University of the Philippines to develop the Austria Band infant ventilator. I was fortunate to be a part of that team. By 2015, Dr. Austria, through the Breath of Life Foundation that he founded, started distributing the Austria event to different hospitals in Metro Manila. At present, more than 70, that's 70 units, have been distributed and are being used in various hospitals all over the Philippines. Unlike commercial ventilators wherein the device is placed between the supply of air and oxygen mixture and the patient, the Austria vent is placed after the patient. Instead of directly controlling the delivery of the mixture to the patient, the Austria vent controls the exhaust air out of the system. Let me show you how this is done. Okay, so the Austria event is protected by a utility model registration, so I am at liberty to disclose its operation. The main uh, component is the solenoid valve. It is used to alternate the flow of exhaust air mixture between a high pressure path and a low pressure path. With the continuous input flow of regulated air and oxygen mixture, when the solenoid valve is closed, and because the flow to the lower path is restricted by, by the small opening of the PIP valve, most of the mixture is forced to flow into the patient's lungs here. The PIP valve is a throttling valve, and it controls the PIP by adjusting this small opening. When the solenoid valve opens, the airflow tends to move toward the lower pressure path, that is, through the, PI, the PEEP valve. The air inside the patient's lungs also tends to be expelled out. The PEEP valve is also a trapping valve, and it controls the PEEP by adjusting its opening. The solenoid valve is controlled by a, progr by a programmable logic controller, or a PLC which can be set to determine the number of breaths per minute and the length of inspiratory time or eye time. This PLC also takes the real-time pressure in the system and compares the value to user settable limits and issues over and under pressure alarms accordingly. <clears throat> These are the features of the infant ventilator. It is a pressure limit time cycle ventilator. It can do 0 to 80 breaths per minute. The, the PEP can be set from 0 to 15 uh, cm of water. There are audible, audible and visual alarms with adjustable alarm limits. It has a bar graph display of real-time pressure along with the PIP and PEP alarm limits. It has a colored 7-inch touchscreen user interface. <clears throat> Excuse me. It can display the pressure waveform in real time. 
It records internally up to 3,000 data logs, which can be retrieved through a USB flash drive. The Austria event, however, has limitations, which make it unsuitable for use for COVID-19 patients. First, it, is, it was designed for infant use only, while most of the patients are adults. It is pressure controlled, but the requirement is for volume controlled ventilators. It can, it can handle only up to 10 liters per minute airflow rates, but adult requirements can, give, can go as high as 70 liters per minute. There is no tidal volume measurement. There is no bacterial or viral filter. Inspiratory time is up to 0.8 seconds only. <clears throat> In the latter part of March of this year, during the start of the community quarantine, Dr. Austria formed a new team to develop an adult version of the Austria band which can be used in this pandemic. I was called again to handle the electrical engineering aspect. That was the time I met Dr. Fausto, our host in this session, who became part of the medical team. Anyway, the new OSHA event has to meet the following requirements. It should be for adult use also. It must be able to handle air flows up to 70 liters per minute. The maximum inspiratory time of 0.8 seconds should be increased to two seconds. There should be an option for volume controlled operation. Of course, with volume control, there should be tidal volume measurement. There should be bacteria, bacterial or viral filter. Now, now let us go back to the operation of the infant ventilator. Increasing the maximum inspiratory time from 0.8 to 2 seconds is quite simple. As mentioned earlier, the operation of the solenoid valve is controlled by the PLC. Thus, changing the maximum eye time was just a matter of changing a few codes in the PLC's program. On increasing the flow rate, <clears throat> we did not have any idea on what the effect of the increased flow rate on the ventilator will be. Thus, we subjected the ventilator with around 30 liters per minute of flow to see what would happen. We, we noticed that the pipes, the tubings, the components, the valves, all can handle the higher flow rate. But we also noticed that it takes a while for the pressure to drop from PIP to PEP upon the opening of the solenoid valve. We therefore had to add a means to improve the PEP decay time. So you see here, there's the, the pressure is, it takes a slow time to decay. So we had to add a means of uh, increasing that uh, decay time. At this point, I cannot disclose the specifics of how we did that as we will be filing a patent for it. And nonetheless, we were able to meet the required PEP decay times with this contraction. <clears throat> as explained earlier, the OSHA event comes after the patient and not before it. The use of a filter is therefore not as a precaution against the transfer of microorganisms from one patient to the next user, but against their release to the surrounding air. The question was where to put it, at the input or at the output? At the input, it will prevent contamination of ventilator components. The, the filter, however, may affect pressure and flow readings, especially when it becomes clogged. At, if at output, there will be minimal effect on the ventilator performance. The drawback is that microorganisms, the virus, might accumulate inside and will be difficult to disinfect later. So we opted to put, it, we opted to put that at the input. 
we devised some workaround to minimize its effect on ventilator performance. Again, I cannot share with you how we did it this time. Volume measurement and volume controlled operation were the main challenges in the development of the Austria Vent 2. Again, I cannot disclose how exactly we did it due to intellectual property concerns. But let me just share that, we, that it was just a matter of choosing the appropriate sensor and feeding the data to the PLC. After which, everything became a programming activity. So let me show you the home screens of the two Austria vents. For Austria vent one on the left, the user can set the BPM and the eye time. Their bar graph displays pressure in real time. The user can set the alarm levels for the maximum and minimum PIP and PEP to the four red lines. There are also displays for mean airway pressure and PIP and PEP. Take note that PIP and PEP are not set through this touch screen, but through their corresponding throttling valves. There's also a button to go to the pressure waveform screen. For the Austria Vent 2 on the right, you can see the additional bar graph of the volume. There is also an option to select uh, between high time or tidal volume modes, which are essentially the two operating modes, pressure control and volume control. There is still the map, PIP and PEP displays, but now there is the tidal volume. There are also additional buttons to display not just the pressure waveform, but uh, also the volume and flow waveforms. We also added a shutdown button to avoid uh, unintended uh, powering down of the unit. So here is a glimpse of the two Austria vent models in operation. You can see the home screens, as well as the waveform screens. On the left, you can see the pressure waveform of the Austria vent one on the right. You can also switch from pressure to volume wave. My engineering team, through constant guidance by the medical team, was able to fabricate the Austria Vent 2 prototype in just one month. That is through April of this year. By May, we were trying it out, clearing all the bugs, addressing the comments and suggestions of the medical team, and other uh, requirements. We tried it twice on the Michigan Lung Simulator of Dr. Balgos in PGH. By June, we were ready to have it certified by the DOST accredited company. Sadly, up to this moment, we are still waiting for our schedule for the certification procedure. That's despite my organization is under the DOST. Apparently, there are so many things we need to comply with, even if they are not within the scope of our claims. Anyway, the remaining tasks after certification are clinical testing, which by the way, we already got the approval to proceed from the UP Manila Ethical Review Board. We, also, we will also be producing five more pre-commercial units for field trials. So four of these will be used in the field, but one will be used by my team in developing a new model with assist control capability. So that's all for the development of the OSEA Vent 2 ventilator. Thank you for listening. Bob, thanks for that uh, wonderful talk.